For our United Way Spotlight of the Week, I'm joined by Constance Carrier Prill, Executive Director of Kingston Indigenous Language Nest. So nice of you to join us today. Thank you for having me. So tell me about an Indigenous Language Nest. So Kiln has been in this community for eight years. Mm -hmm. A lot of people um, have come through our programs. Uh, our programs are open to anybody who identifies as Indigenous as well as people who don't. Um, allies who want to come and join our programming. Um, it was founded actually by a group of wonderful language warriors as we call them. Uh, indigenous people from the community who had started learning the language together and decided they wanted to be able to continue in some capacity and felt that it was their duty to really you know, take the lead in doing that. And so uh, it started around the kitchen table of a local grandmother um, with a, a core group of, of people who really wanted to um, keep you know, supporting the language and, and breathing vitality into the language into this area. And so eight years later, um, this year, we actually got our first building. Uh, so we have our first official site that's at 610 Montreal Street. And um, I came on board in March of this year. And so as an organization, we're sort of at the place where we're growing in our, our operational capacity and the, the programs we can provide. We have some incredible staff, incredible volunteers, some who've been with us for that whole eight years. And uh, we love providing not only um, language presence in the community and representation in the community, but uh, great culturally land-based programs um, that our local urban community feels are, are relevant and, and wonderful to be a part of. So I understand, though, that every Indigenous group speaks a different language. So do you teach in a lot of different languages? Um, yes and no. I think we sort of, we work within the capacity of what we can provide and that's really sort of the crux of, of um, the challenge, I guess, with an urban language revitalization center is that there are so many different languages and nations represented here in the Kingston area. And so we try and um, focus on needs-based programming. So what uh, the majority of the people who are coming to our programs are, are looking for and searching for, we try and provide those languages. Um, you know, our vision is to provide support and resources for all the languages of the area. We're not quite there yet. We do have very strong uh, programming in Anishinaabe Moan, which is the Ojibwe language. We're growing in our capacity to provide uh, Ganengeha, which is the Mohawk language. Um, as well as some other uh, written resources and support resources in some of the other languages of the area. Now, the other thing I, I always heard, and I mean, you can correct me on this, but that it wasn't really a written form language. It was a verbal language that was passed down. Is that accurate or is it actually a written form now? Well, I think that completely depends on the language. It would okay. be very difficult to characterize all languages in the same way. Some languages had different formats, some did not. Um, but at this point in time, certainly our language learners appreciate having um, the oral support as well as the written support in most cases. And so we're trying to develop resources that allow people to have all of the above. Um, and um, as well as the ability to provide resources online, which has been lacking for us a little bit up until this point in time. So we're working on a great project right now actually that will allow us to pivot between sort of an online teaching learning system as well as self-supported online learning um, through a robust website. So it's all things that we're working on implementing. Some people would be better sitting in front of their computer learning and others are better in a group. Or, or do you have groups or is it one-on-one -on -one or? All of the above. Oh, so, really? Um, you know, I think community is very important. Uh, to the Indigenous okay. community. So coming together, learning language together um, is really the best way to learn. I don't think anybody's preference in our community is to sit in front of a computer to learn, but sometimes that's just what we need to do. You know, sometimes there's um, a lot of different reasons why that may be the optional way to learn, and so we want to be able to provide that for folks. But our big focus is on the land learning, learning on the land, which is very culturally important. And, and, tell and me learning more, together as community. Tell me about that term. That's not a term I'm learning on the land. What, what does that mean? So the connection to the land in Indigenous communities is very, very strong. Um, okay. Being caretakers of the land, understanding that that's a relationship, right? That the earth is a relationship for us and all the beings on the earth. And so what Kiln really focuses on is this on-land learning component. So we actually have programs associate who's staffed at Kiln and her role includes on the land learning. So setting up events 
where we come together as a community out into the community on the land in various locations and learn languages together, learn about all of our relations on the land. Um, and that is by far uh, our absolute preferred way to learn the language. Um, a lot of Indigenous languages are very land-based in terms of how the words um, developed and, and that relationship and how they're articulated. And so it lends itself very nicely to being in that environment for learning. And the capacity for learning is increased when we're on the land and the capacity for retention is increased is what we have shown or what we've experienced. And so we're always trying to get out into the community um, and that's important, I think, for an urban community. We have people in all parts of the city. We have some people who have access to transportation or don't. And so we try and actually host programs and events in various locations mm -hmm. that are easily accessible and safe for the community. Well, language is such a, a big part of a culture. And, and it seems to be the one thing in any culture when you think about it, immigrants coming here and their language and then other things start to go by the wayside too. So some of the other, uh, your food, uh, ceremonies and so on, does that come into this at all? Absolutely, it does. So when I say that we, we like to provide land-based, culturally relevant programming, you're gonna find all of those elements usually in kiln programs. So food, very important to our culture, as you mentioned, as with most cultures. Uh, so we do a lot of cooking. We have a kitchen at Kiln. Uh, we do cooking together. Um, we work very closely in partnership with Loving Spoonful, who, as everyone knows, just a wonderful, brilliant organization here. We work in partnership and collaboration on a lot of our, our programs as well. And um, their chef, T. Breda, has been wonderful and, uh, and come and done cooking with us as well. Um, so you see, see cultural elements in terms of the arts, you see cultural elements in terms of the language, and you see cultural elements in terms of uh, ceremony and cooking and, and all of those things that are meaningful to the community, generally in most of our kiln events. It's mostly women, mostly men that you're attracting to, uh, to your organization. All, all ages, mm -hmm. all demographics, all really? genders. Um, I think typically in this area, most of our language warriors have been women, um, but we have more uh, men who are becoming involved in that. We have uh, men represented on our board of directors uh, and in our programs. We certainly have a lot of men in the community who are teachers, oh, who are okay. knowledge keepers, um, and, um, and participate and, and come and share that knowledge and those teachings with our community as well. So we have folks of all different genders and, uh, and ages and in terms of people we want to come to the programs, everybody. So that's one of the, the things we're focusing on right now is looking at our gaps in our programming. Who don't we have programs for and who right. can we start to develop programs for? So um, we've just launched um, the Kiln Youth Connections program, which is launching this month. Um, for youth aged 12 to 19 to serve the need of, of having uh, an Indigenous drop-in for, for that demographic. And we also have zero to six programming and most of our programming in our events is actually open to all ages. So we have a lot of families. Family is very important in our community and so we often have, you know, everywhere from very young children to, to grandparents coming to our events. It sounds like a wonderful organization and I understand the United Way had a lot of lot to do with your success. Can you tell me about that? The United Way is, uh, I mean, they're so skilled um, at so many things, but one of the things I've personally found is they are very, very um, determined to step into the gaps, you know, and say to an organization, okay, what do you need? So an organization like ours, where we have sort of multiple smaller sources of, of funding and grant funding, the United Way is able to come in and say, you know, what do you need now? Where can we help? And so where United Way has been able to step into that gap for us is through those conversations. So one of the things that we had recognized as an organization is that being able to provide programs is not enough. We actually have a lot of issues in terms of barriers for people of our community to even be able to come and access our programs. And so United Way stepped into that gap by providing funding for transportation, for food for families who come, whether that be also you know clothing for our outdoor programs, you know we think not all our families have clothing to be able to come and attend outside. Okay. Um, so being able to provide funding in that capacity to get people to our programs and, and give them what they need uh, while they're there, and then they've also stepped into the funding with our Kiln Youth Connections group this fall that has actually been funded by the United Way. Um, wow. And that's the first program that we have in this area for that younger age demographic in the the preteen group. 
it sounds like a good partnership. Oh, it's a beautiful partnership. <laughs> We're tremendously grateful for it. And thank you for telling me about it. Thank you for having me.